okay? So if we look at necrosis and we look at the different categories of necrosis, you can see very quickly in science we like to categorize stuff, okay? So depending upon what course and what textbook you look at, you're going to get slightly different types of categories. And it's important that you understand that because what, there's nothing more embarrassing when you go to med school or if you go to grad school or PT school or nursing school or dental school and you correct the professor and then you come to realize that um, it's just a different, you know, categorical uh, nomenclature than what we describe. Okay, so avoid yourself the embarrassment and just understand that these are pretty generally the categories that we'll talk about, but there are some subtle differences that you might run across, okay? The first type of necrosis, again, so in a necrotic situation, when the tissue becomes necrotic, uh, and it's non-reversible, you get fibrosis or scarring. And that's not much different than, you know, that big scar you have on your arm or your leg. You know, if you took a digger off a skateboard or, you know, you did an endo off the front of your handlebars in the woods, um, you, you probably have a nice lesion and it's going to heal, but you're going to have a pretty aggressive scar. And um, some of you have been in, you know, car accidents and you've been very fortunate. Uh, some of you just clumsy, just flat out clumsy, okay? And, uh, and you know that uh, there are hearts that are dying You don't have to self-identify, that's cool, you know? Um, but uh, that, that tissue doesn't feel like the rest of your skin, you can tell. That's fibrotic scar. And that happens in all tissues, not just on the surface of your skin. And you also know if it's an aggressive fibrotic wound or scar at the level of the integument, um, the functionality of that tissue has been compromised. For example, if it's on your head, if you, your hair may not have grown back in that location. If it's on your arm or your leg, maybe the hair doesn't come back there. Okay? If you look histologically, you wouldn't see a lot of the sebaceous glands or the American glands. You wouldn't see things that are indicative of normal tissue of skin. And that's the same thing that you're going you're gonna to find in this situation. So this is actually, well, that was like the worst. <laughs> Uh, shot ever. That's the only reason I didn't go on with my basketball career. <laughs> only reason. <laughs> so kidneys, heart, and adrenal glands. That wasn't supposed to be a joke. <laughs> kidneys, heart, and adrenal glands. Tissues essentially that have a tree branch like architecture where the blood vessel comes in, okay, and it branches off kind of like this. If you create a blockage of blood in this location, right here, you're going to get a wedge-shaped wound where those blood vessels would have perfused. Does that make sense? And so you can see here, uh, this is spleen, this is splenic tissue. And in this spleen, you've got this wedge-shaped infarct. And you can see it very prominently here. And it kind of looks like what I drew on the board because the vascular pattern of kidney, heart, adrenal gland, spleen is in a branch-like pattern here. And if you cut off blood flow here, you get this wedge-shaped infarct that's going down. Here's an older infarct that is kind of an older scar but similar type of shape. So the proteins denature in that region. They become non-functional. And this is typically secondary to what we call acute ischemia, where you've reduced blood flow to the area and you um, are causing a lowering of the oxygenation of that tissue. And therefore, if you don't have oxygen present, how much and how well can you make ATP without, without the presence of oxygen? You can't make it very well. You can still make little bits of it using a glycolytic pathway, but if you don't have oxygen, oxygen present as the final electron 
acceptor, you cannot run through electron transport chain and generate copious amounts of ATP. Okay? Fibrosis. This is a fibrotic scar right here that's newer, and here is an older lesion just to your left. Coagulative necrosis. Another example. This is kidney tissue, right? Similar type of uh, arrangement. What are all these? Uh, what are all these circles? Those are lamellae, right? If you look at kidney tissue, oops, and if you look at um, uh, that's infarcted tissue. This is normal tissue. You can see the glomeruli here are nice and healthy. If we set them side by side, we have normal kidney tissue on your left, and we have infarcted kidney tissue on the right. This is from this digital histology DVD. Somebody asked at the break, um, so how should I study the histology? But you should know the histology that I show in lecture. Now, I will not pick histology that you have not seen before. It is not essential that you buy this disc and memorize every single slide. Okay? Some of you may be interested in learning a little bit more. That's why it's there. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is a, a very appropriate comparison to be able to, to ask you about because we've talked about it. Okay, I've explained it. And you had a lot of histology in your prerequisite courses, but even if you missed and skipped that section, uh, we'll have covered it in its entirety here. So you can kind of see with coagulant necrosis at the level of the microscopic tissue anatomy, here are glomeruli that are fully functional in the normal kidney, all of these round sphere structures. You can see here the glomerulus itself is actually kind of shrunken in, Right? It's darker and stained. You can see the Bowman's capsule is much more pronounced here. There's a little bit of white space surrounding here, Bowman's uh, space, but not nearly as much as here. This one probably just popped out artifactually during histology. The ones that are vacant completely, I don't want you to think that you know they were just like alien zapped. They probably, when the knife comes through the tissue, and because it's not hanging, it's not connected to anything anymore, it probably hit it and just popped out. Okay, it's like jello with the fruit in it, and you put that knife through it, and you cut your slice of jello with the fruit inside, sometimes the fruit flies out, and hits your sister, and you laugh, right? <laughs> so, um, this is probably a histological artifact, but you can kind of appreciate the difference, coagulative necrosis as well. Second type of necrosis, liquefactive necrosis. This targets organs like um, nervous tissue. So you're going to have the brain, neurons and glial cells of the brain. Um, liquefactive necrosis is named such because the brain cells are very high in hydrolytic enzymes and the brain itself has very little connective tissue. And so there's digestion that starts taking place as those enzymes, those hydrolytic enzymes get freed up. <coughs> And so what ends up happening in this, this is a coronal slice, right, anterior to posterior division. And this little region up here is liquefactive necrosis. This is on the patient's left hemisphere. Okay, so this is the left side, this is the patient's right side. Right, here's our lateral ventricles here and here, just to orient you. And this is a region likely due to a stroke, and this tissue became necrotic and it's called liquefactive necrosis. It's very common on autopsy to find a lot of pus in that region. The characteristics of liquefactive necrosis is they're more irregular. It's not wedge-shaped, like what we just talked about. There's oft, often empty space when you section through the tissue. You have many phagocytic cells that are present. These are the microglial cells that act like mini phagocytes to try to clean up the debris. So you also see this with a pyogenic bacterial infection, and that bacterial infection is what will make pus. 
Okay, so that might be another circumstance that you would see liquefactive necrosis in non-neural tissue is if it was a pyogenic bacterial infection. And again, the pus forms there because of the hydrolytic enzymes that are being released from the leukocytes that are recruited to the area to try to kill off the bacteria. Make sense? Okay, next up is caseous necrosis. This one's really disgusting, actually. And there's no other way to describe it. This is just full on. This one, when I'm in my office at home, you know, kind of cruising through slides, this is the one where I like just make sure there isn't a little kid wandering down the hallway. Because this one might freak them out, okay? Um, and there's, you know, daddy has lots of gross slides. There's no question about that. This one's probably one of the grosser ones. Um, Caseous necrosis. It's very common to see caseous necrosis in tuberculosis infections. So this is going to be at the level of the lungs. Pulmonary infections. It's kind of a combination between coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. So you're going to see pus forming. But you're going to see because of the architectural organization of the lungs, you might see a very defined border. You know, it may not be wedge shaped. So it's not completely coagulative, but it has coagulative-like characteristics. So the top image is a tuberculosis lung with caseous necrosis. That's that yellowish-white, cheesy debris. Okay, right here. I'm sure it's stinky. Okay. That's caseous necrosis right here. The bottom image is... Uh, a lymph node, the bottom right, that's a lymph node. That's infected with tuberculosis, and the nose have, node itself has a cheesy tan appearance to it. Okay, right here. This is a lymph node that's kind of in this necrotic realm. This right here is a chest x-ray, and this is a patient that has advanced tuberculosis, and you can actually see, right, the formation of the cavity that's being outlined, right, right here. You see this little, these, these black arrows are outlining where this little necro cases necrosis TB infection is. Okay, that's caseous. Fat necrosis. This one's quite interesting because um, fat tissue itself, so any tissues that have a high concentration of fat, breast tissue, pancreatic tissue, lots of other abdominal organs are going to go through fat necrosis. And this, bless you, this is something that happens as you get older, right? So these organs, it's not atypical for them to exhibit uh, fatty nodule deposits as we age, which is part of the aging process. But it's a pathological condition, okay? Now, fat necrosis that takes place gets cellular dissolution due to the lipases that are present in these tissues. These lipases digest the triglycerides, and as the triglycerides that are, are digested away, you get free fatty acids that bind up with calcium that's in the vicinity. And you also have calcium along with magnesium and sodium in that extracellular environment. And that forms a process or leads to a process known as saponification. So you get fat plus magnesium, uh, uh, sodium, right, and calcium leads to a saponification process is how you make soap. So like soap meaning like a bar of soap, like ivory soap, how it's hard. That's what these saponified fat will feel like. And if it's in breast tissue, that breast tissue, it may be a false alarm for a lump. So it's not uncommon as women get older, in their middle ages, under self-exam, to feel something that makes them un uncomfortable. And they go in and they go further investigate. Okay, and they do uh, a mammogram, and they see uh, uh, nodules, and then maybe they move on to a breast biopsy, 
and then it's confirmed at, at biopsy that it's just uh, saponified tissue. It's no big deal. And then that patient knows that that's sort of the normal process of their tissue, and it's not to be alarming. Okay, so that's one of the most common um, uh, false alarms for for uh, you know women thinking that they un under self examination thinking that they might have a nodule or a lump in their breast. Okay, fat necrosis, and you can kind of see on this picture the little fatty um, debris. This is this is pancreas right here, um, and all these little nodules are saponified fat as this patient has aged over time. Okay, gangrenous necrosis. This was pretty gross too. Yeah, I don't think it's too bad. No, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, is this up there? This is out there. Is this worse? Oh, just wait. We got way worse. Um, so, gangrenous necrosis, right? So this is more of a clinical term. Um, it's less common in the scientific literature. It's much more common in the clinical literature. And gangrenous necrosis typically happens due to severe hypoxic injury. Okay, so for example, blood flow is reduced to the distal extremities, um, and therefore oxygenation to those tissues is compromised. Uh, and uh, this can be facilitated in cold environments if you're out and you're exposed. Okay, and that's what happened with this patient right here. Okay, out in the snow, wet, cold, blood flow, um, when you're cold, uh, is shunted towards the core and away from the extremities, and so that just sort of facilitates the problem. Yeah. So is this frostbite, or is it... Is it what? Is it frostbite? Is it the same Yeah, thing? so this would be, this situation here would be frostbite in the toes, okay? So there's different types, though, of gangrenous necrosis. Uh, dry gangrene is kind of most similar to coagulative necrosis. The tissue shrinks and becomes black or brown or tan. And um, that's the frostbite that you're looking at right here. Okay, dry gangrene. Wet gangrene usually happens when neutrophils invade. And in order for neutrophils to invade, you actually have to have some amount of blood flow still intact because the neutrophils come out of the bloodstream. So this is more common in internal organs, a wet gangrene. So now what happens is the tissue swells, it becomes cold, and it could be black in appearance upon dissection. Um, usually it has a foul odor, and there's lots of pus. And the, and the reason there's lots of pus is because you have the neutrophils there with their digestive enzymes. And then the last type of gangrene is gas gangrene. This is usually due to anaerobic bacteria like a, a clostridium infection. The bacteria itself releases toxins and hydrolytic enzymes and that goes on and digests the connective tissue. And where it gets its terminology of gas gangrene is little bubbles will typically form within the tissue, especially if it's muscle tissue, um, as a result of the bacteria's survival and propagation. Okay? So more of a clinical term, dry gangrene is really your classic frostbite. Uh, the wet gangrene will happen uh, most commonly um, on abdominal procedures. If the um, intestines kind of get turned around or pinched off and they're becoming necrotic inside the, the belly, that would be a wet gangrenous situation. Okay? And if it's left untreated, it could actually be lethal. All right, so if we look at frostbite or this example of skin gangrene, again, this is uh, taken from that, that histology DVD, so another really great comparison slide. On the left is normal skin. In fact, this is the same type of skin sample, normal plantar skin, that you looked at in 201 at this institution. Okay? Because I made all those slides as well. <laughs> so, if you take, this is the epidermis, right? So this is the top layer, and some patients, students, patients, some students will say, it's upside down. Well, okay, if you hold your hand like this, you know, the you know, superficial part is this way, okay? 
or the bottom of your foot in anatomical position. So this is the epidermis. Here is the epidermis dermal interface. This is dermis. You with me? So epidermis here, dermis here. You're more used to looking at this slide flipped upwards, but you guys are accelerated, so you can figure it out. If I took an example of that toe in a biopsy, this is what the dermis would look like. Okay? See the relative amount of purple versus pink? What is the purple? What are those cells? What do you think they are? They're neutrophils early on. So these are inflammatory, infiltrating neutrophils. Perfect answer. Okay? After a couple of days, macrophages will be there most prevalently. Okay, but the first cells that show up are the neutrophils. Questions over the types of necrosis. Okay, in our last little segment for today, we need to start looking at the mechanisms. The mechanisms by which injury takes place. There was a question or a comment earlier about um, the membrane and how it gets digested away. So this is where we're going to start talking about that. So this slide is basically showing if you have an injury up here, you're going to get sort of four main results straight out of your textbook, the 8th edition. Okay, but the ninth edition picture looks almost like this. Okay? So if you have an injury to the cell, and the cell is not um, receiving enough oxygen, we already said that ATP is compromised, the production of ATP goes down, right? If you damage the membrane, well, you release lysosomal contents, which consists of enzymes, and that starts digesting away the cellular components. If you damage the, the membrane itself, you may lose some of the cellular components, and also, if you damage uh, the membrane, uh, the result to the mitochondria is lethal, and that also further exaggerated your loss of ATP production. Injury to the cell itself can damage the cytoskeleton, and if you have cytoskeletal damage, you will ultimately end up with membrane damage, right? Because the cytoskeleton is attached to the membrane. Um, if you damage the cell, and it re leads to DNA damage, now you actually start getting um, what potentially could be a positive thing. Whereas if you have damage to the DNA and it's detected, you're going to trigger it immediately for apoptosis. And that's one of the main triggers for apoptosis is the integrity of the DNA. That's what the cell is policing, is, is the DNA compromised? And if it is, then let's just quit right now and not allow the cell to replicate. Okay? So if you look at our cellular responses to injury, <clears throat> we can kind of see two sides of the coin. So there's a line right down the middle. We've got things that happen to the cell by the cell itself, known as autophagy. And we have things that happen to the cell maybe by neighboring cells, heterophagy. So it depends, the response of the cell depends on the type of injury how long it lasts, and the severity of the insult. Under autophagy, the cell itself can degrade some of its own compounds or components. So you can see over on the autophagy side, we can kind of package organelles like this mitochondria, and we can actually digest it down and spit that out via exocytosis if necessary. Under um, Heterophagy, we may ingest something from another cell, and this would be an example of what a macrophage would be capable of doing. It's bringing in a, a cell particulate from a necrotic tissue bed and breaking it down and then exocytosing the parts. So two different ways, main ways, that the cell can respond to injury. So if we look at hypoxia, Hypoxia is one of our big main causes of cellular injury. That was one of our long laundry lists. Remember that at the beginning of the lecture? Hypoxia is referring to what? Loss of 
oxygen, low oxygen environment, right? So the most common cause is ischemia, right? Where you've reduced blood flow to the tissue and you've stimulated this hypoxic environment of low oxygenation. The example that we classically use today is the kidney tubule. Upper right image is normal kidney tubule, and the lower right image is acute tubular necrosis. Right? So this is our adaptation that's taking place. So let's dig a little bit deeper and see, okay, how exactly did this happen? You keep saying blood flow is compromised and then the cell dies. Isn't there something in between that? Okay. So this is the slide of what's in between. Blood flow gets cut off, cell dies. So let's take a look at this. It looks busy, but it's really not that complicated. So this is representing blood flow. And you can see here's a blockage. So it's red on the left and it's vacant on the right. So this tissue is not getting any blood flow. Now it's ischemic. If it's not getting any blood flow, you're not oxygenating that tissue. You're not getting oxygen to the cell. Therefore, the mitochondria see no oxygen. If the mitochondria see no oxygen, you lower oxidative phosphorylation. You're not going to manufacture ATP using aerobic pathways. If you lower ATP, you compromise on the far left the sodium bond, right? Because it needs, the sodium potassium ATPase bond needs ATP to run it. Remember that? If you compromise the sodium potassium pump, then you also get an influx of calcium and sodium, and you lose potassium. This is back, it's back to basic bio, right? If this ionic imbalance happens, then you start seeing the swelling of the cell. That's where it comes from. Okay, so let's back up. You lose ATP. Well, now you start, you don't just say, okay, give up, you know, uncle. You try your best as a cell. So you use glycolytic pathways, and you're using glycolysis and glucose, or glycogen, converting it to glucose, running it through glycolysis to generate small amounts of ATP, but that's sort of your final survival last-ditch effort. Well, what happens there when you increase anaerobic glycolysis? Well, you lose glycogen stores, you raise lactic acid production, that lowers your pH, that means it's more acidic, for those of you who can't remember that, and that causes the clumping of the nuclear material. Okay, now let's back up again to the third arm. You lose ATP production, you start detaching the ribosomes, and you lose protein synthesis. If you lose protein synthesis, that means you can't repair anything. So all of this stuff, all of these details, point back to this cause of the loss of blood flow. Is that clear? Yes. Why back here in the up front. Why would it detach its ribosomes? Well, the ribosomal detachment is dependent upon adequate ATP production. Okay. Where's this? Oh, endoplasmic reticulum swelling. You'll get swelling of both rough and smooth ER. Yeah. So the swelling that takes place is throughout the entire cell. All right, so let's look at over here. Decreased mitochondrial activity lowers what? ATP levels. You get ionic pump failure, you get glycogen decreased, and you get decreased protein synthesis. Okay. Protein synthesis in of itself is an energy requiring process, right? You can't transcribe and translate if you have no energy within the cell. Okay, so this is a pretty important mechanistic slide. I know it looks busy, but hopefully walking through it like that makes it fairly clear. Okay, so backing up to calcium. So if I go over to this ionic mismatch, right, we have an influx of calcium inside the cell, because typically we do a really careful job of keeping the calcium out of the cell or sequestered up inside a compartment in the cell, in the case of muscle, right? But we call that what? Sarcoplasmic particulate. Very close. Very close. 
So the sarcoblast reticulum is that special storage facility in muscle cells where calcium is stored. Do you guys remember that? Smooth muscle stores calcium in the extracellular space. It pumps it out. Okay? So calcium is not usually high inside the cell. Neither is sodium high inside the cell. Where is sodium typically high? Outside the cell. Okay, along with chloride, and that's what makes the salt water solution that most of our cells like to live in. A saline bath, right? So if you focus on the calcium now, why is calcium bad inside the cell? And this gets back to your question or point earlier. If we have a flood of calcium inside the cell, look at all of these ACEs that get turned on by calcium. Calcium activates ATP ACEs, phospholipases, proteases, and endonucleases. Not good. Because a ATPase is going to lower the amount of readily available ATP. A phospholipase is going to chew up your membrane. There's where the holes come from. That was your question earlier. A protease is going to ruin your cytoskeleton and any other proteins that are sitting around. And last but definitely not least, an endonuclease is going to destroy your chromatin. So you're pretty much screwed. Okay. So calcium high inside the cell, chronically unmanaged, is a signal that the cell is done. It's over. Our last mechanistic slide. And then we'll finish up kind of in a little bit more of a coast, some cool little anecdotes. Reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are a strategy that macrophages use in order to kill bacteria. Okay, and so what they do is they use what we call this Fenton reaction. So you get a superoxide that becomes a hydrogen peroxide. And through the Fenton reaction, you have a hydroxyl radical, which is your free radical or your reactive oxygen species. They can be used, this reactive OH group can be used to go oxidize all sorts of different things. And if it comes across bacteria, it basically kills them. So what the body does, instead of just you know, spray gunning reactive oxygen species all over your body and just and killing everything, Right? How many of you use hydrogen peroxide on cups? And you like the way it like bubbles and foams, right? Did you know you can overdo it? Have you ever overdone a wound with hydrogen peroxide? Because it kills your fibroblasts in your skin as well. So you, or if you douse your skin wound with hydrogen peroxide and you do it too frequently, you will actually destroy your own native tissue. So you can't just start spewing out all this free radical stuff to kill bacteria. Instead, what you do is you find bacteria, you engulf it phagocytically inside a macrophage, and then you combine that macrophage with a lysosome that contains the free radical, and then you have this reaction happen inside of the macrophage. Make sense? So that's exactly what you do here, is you form a free radical, and um, this free radical species gets to um, uh, go around and destroy, using macrophages, um, any bacteria. Now, in some cases, this can get out of control because those macrophages can be lysed. If those macrophages are lysed and the reactive oxygen species reacts with fatty acids, proteins, or DNA, it oxidizes all of those and it causes problems. You can see fatty acids, now you get disruption of the plasma membrane. Reactive oxygen species will cause a loss of appropriate folding and you lose the ability of the protein to function like it normally should. If it's an enzyme, no more enzymatic activity. If it oxidizes DNA, now you get mutations that could be cancerous. So we don't want a lot of free radicals floating around. We want to contain within the macrophages, which we normally do. But when they get released inappropriately, they cause a lot of damage. So we have a way, naturally, to remove free radicals. And there's a lot of these antioxidant buzz, right? Like everyone's eating blueberries like crazy. 
you guys with me? Because blueberries are very rich in antioxidants. And that's why people are so into blueberries. Okay? And there's a lot of other foods that are, are naturally enriched with antioxidant capabilities. But we make them ourselves. So like, for example, um, SOD, which is found in the mitochondria, superoxide dismutase in the mitochondria, it converts this free oxygen back to H2O2. So it kind of goes this direction. Um, glutathione peroxidase converts the OH back to hydrogen peroxide. Catalase converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So once you get to this intermediate step, you can go further and make water and oxygen using catalase. So our body itself has natural antioxidant capabilities, but now, of course, in our diet, we're really excited about adding in different types of antioxidants. Question? When would this left-hand scenario happen? When would this side right here happen? Yeah. So this side right here would happen is if you had, for example, maybe um, too much UV exposure, radiation. So any of these, radiation, UV exposure, uh, chemicals, you're exposed to harsh chemicals, um, or inflammation in any disease state. So we're going to look throughout the entire semester. We're going to see a lot of examples of inflammatory pathologies and in inflammation because inflammation uses macrophages, and macrophages have reactive oxygen species within them. If the inflammation subsides, nothing bad happens. If the inflammation, inflammation sticks around chronically, then the macrophages eventually start losing the war. They start lysing, and they release ROSs. And that's, that's why a lot of chronic infl inflammatory diseases, uh, like IBS or chronic untreated asthma, okay, uh, inflammatory diseases of the myelin and MS, a lot of those things lead to further problems because you have reactive oxygen species that stick around. Okay? All right. If we um, take a look at a topic that's uh, a little bit sensitive and sad, one of the most common overdoses in pediatric patients is actually with acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol. Okay, that's the name brand that has the active drug acetaminophen in it. Okay, this is the non-aspirin pain reliever that you buy in the store if you buy a generic brand. But if you look at the back of the label, the drug itself is called acetaminophen. So what the heck is acetaminophen? Well, it's a pain reliever. It's an analgesic. And um, it is consumed in our body, and the liver itself processes all drugs. And so it's detoxified by the liver. The problem is there is an intermediate in the detoxification process that's actually a hepatotoxin meaning that it's toxic to liver cells themselves. So if you look at the back of the, of the jar, and it says don't take more than X amount over X hours, the reason is it's trying, they're, they're trying to keep your dosing under the threshold of which that intermediate will stick around in your liver and cause hepatocyte death. And the most common way to overdose are well-meaning parents where the kid's not feeling well, so they give them Tylenol, and then they're going to put them to bed and they got a runny nose, so they give them a cold medicine. But the cold medicine actually has acetaminophen in it, and they're not reading the label carefully. So they just gave them Tylenol, like at dinner time, and then right before they go to bed, like two hours later, they're giving another dose of nighttime cold medicine. And the kid wakes up at one in the morning, they give another dose of nighttime cold medicine. And then they wake up, you know, again at three in the morning, they give another dose. And, you know, in, in the breakfast, they give them more Tylenol, and it's like all of a sudden they're not feeling well because the liver is starting to fail. Okay, so here in this picture, you can see healthy liver on the upper left, and I found this division point right here. You can, you can draw a dotted line down here. This is necrotic liver tissue right here. So what the heck's going on with acetaminophen poisoning? Well, you've got three pathways for acetaminophen metabolism. It's conjugated with sulfate. That's the first bullet point. Conjugated with sulfate. And then it's conjugated with glucuronide. And the third way is it's metabolized using the cytochrome P450 oxidase. In the cytochrome P450 oxidase, there's an intermediate 
as it breaks it down, which is called NAPQI. This NAPQI right here is actually the toxin to the liver. So eventually, it pairs with glutathione and it's rendered um, harmless. And the metabolism using the first two processes is about 90% of detoxifying acetaminophen. It's only 10% of the dose that actually goes through this cytochrome P450 <coughs> oxidase. But again, the problematic point is this intermediate called NAPQI, which is the liver toxin. Okay, so you just don't want to dose faster than what the liver can detoxify. All right, in our last little segment for today, you guys still with me? We're almost done. In our last little segment, I want to look at some of our cellular infiltrations as it responds to the injury. So we've talked about uh, manifestations that take place. We've talked about water. We've talked about um, how the lipids change. We've talked about how glycogen decreases. We've even talked about how proteins are rendered denatured and non-functional. Calcium comes in and activates all these ACEs, these enzymes, that chew up everything. Okay. Well, the last thing that we need to talk about are pigments. And in pathology, a lot of the pigmentation will give us a lot of clues about what's happening in the tissue. So, for example, if we look at these slides, we're going to talk about two examples. We're going to talk about hemosiderin. Hemosiderin is what you find in bruises. Hemosiderin are basically an uh, excess accumulation of iron. And the bruise, you know how a bruise has sort of a coloration to it? But you see hem hemosiderin that uh, takes place in other tissues pathologically other than just bruises. So the lower left is a Prussian blue stain. And you're looking at hemosiderin levels that are these purple or bluish dots, right? So these blue dots that are formed right here. Here's a cluster of all these blue dots. That's hemosiderin. Up here, the hemosiderin is actually colored in a brown stain. Okay, and both of these are actually liver tissue. Liver tissue. And this is because the liver itself is so active in iron recycling, over time, it's not uncommon as we get older for you to see an increase in hemosiderin levels in the liver because of the residual relics of iron that stick around in the liver. So on autopsy, right, they find a patient, they're trying to figure out how old the patient is. If there was very low levels of hemosiderin in the liver, that patient was probably pretty young. If there's lots of hemosiderin, like you see on the upper right, that was probably an older patient. Okay, so you can kind of tell based upon the age of the organ by hemosiderin. Lipofusion is another example on the lower right. Lipofusion is due to the breakdown of cellular organelles. Cellular organelles. This is cardiac muscle. And the lipofusion you're looking at are denoted by the black arrows. Looks a little different than here. But the breakdown of organelles over time is leaving these residual lipofusion streaks. And it's an indication of wear and tear of cardiac muscle. So these are two aging pathologies. Right? Back to sort of our original question. As we get older, the pathology of age shows up in our organs based on signatures like cardiac muscle on the lower right, lipofusion streaks, and two different types of stains of hemosiderin, iron that's left over of the recycling of iron that comes out of RBC recycling. And those are both indications of older aged organ tissue. Now, our last example for today are calcium accumulations. There's two main types. We've got what we call dystrophic, which is found in dead and dying tissues. 
found in tuberculosis, as well as atherosclerotic lesions. And we're going to go back to atherosclerotic lesions at the end of the semester. If you look at your syllabus, we're going to cap the end of the semester with cardiovascular, and we'll talk about vascular disease. And this right here is not a blood vessel. What is that a picture of? How did you know that? Because it's labeled in the upper right corner. Sweet. This is the aortic valve. Okay? This is an old aortic valve in a patient. And all of this crustiness right here, you see this? This is all calcium, dystrophic calcium that's depositing. And this is the opening of the valve right through here. Okay? So dystrophic calcium deposition. The last one is metastatic, and this is typically found in patients with hypercalcemia. Metastatic calcium deposits that will be found in undamaged tissue um, causes for metastatic hypercalcemia are hyperparathyroidism, high, high vitamin D levels, hyperthyroidism, hypercalcemia during infancy, patients who suffer from Addison's um, those are some of the main ones, okay? So, in this lecture, we took a look at um, different types of necrosis. We compared and contrast apoptosis with necrosis. We looked mechanistically on how injury takes place and why it's so dangerous to lose blood flow to organs. Now, here's an example of the type of exam question that you might see. And I want to walk you guys through this in the remaining minutes. And the gross appearance of the myocardium shown here from a 58-year-old 50 year man who was admitted with chest pain is most consistent with which of the following microscopic changes? Do you guys want me to dim the lights? Okay. Gross appearance in this slide of the myocardium. So what organ is it? Heart. Shown here from a 58-year-old man who was admitted with chest pain. So what do you think happened? Maybe it's a heart attack. Is most consistent with which of the following microscopic changes? And I have a list of four types of necrosis and then apoptosis. So is it apoptosis? No. How do you know that? How do you know it's not apoptosis? It wouldn't be a whole organ affected for apoptosis, right? It's at the cellular, maybe the tissue level. You know that clinically there was a heart attack, most likely, because the chest pain. So what does that tell you about blood flow? It was probably suddenly stopped, right? So that would eliminate apoptosis. I would agree. Now you got four types of necrosis to decide from. <coughs> So how would you go down the list? Liquefaction necrosis. Why not that one? It's not brain or neural tissue. I agree. Okay. Could happen in other situations, but that usually meant there was a bacterial infection. There's nothing here that says this was bacterial infection. Okay. I, I agree. I eliminate uh, A and E. Caseous necrosis. It's cheesy like, right? It's not cheesy enough, Keller. All right. Fine. What organs does caseous target? Caseous necrosis. Lungs. Who said that? Lungs. Very good. Not the only organ, but that's also lymph nodes. We gave an example of lymph node and lung. Okay. Fat necrosis. Why not that one? Is the heart very fatty as an organ? No. Why do you like coagulative other than the fact it's the only one remaining? Why do you like that one? Right, you've got a little bit of a wedge shape right here. Do you see this? Okay. And the heart itself isn't on the list of organs that typically respond with a coagulative necrotic type of pathology. Absolutely. Okay, so that's how you would walk through a, a, an exam question. Does that make sense? Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. Any other questions before we end today? Look at that. Did we end early? I should laugh for the next two minutes or I should let you go. Don't forget your post.
quiz that's due Friday. You can do it tonight. You can do it tomorrow. Let me let me tell you. But make sure when you sit down to do it, you finish it in one sitting. If you walk away, the timer still goes. So if you're really good, you can walk away, you know, get a coffee, come back. You know, if you want to add a little level of stress to your test experience. But you have 30 minutes to complete it. Most often, you need to do it in one sitting. If you get kicked out accidentally, you can go back in. But the clock's still running. Okay, due Friday by 11.59 p.m. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you next week.